afterwards. afterwards. Okay. <laughs> um, how would you explain the economic success of Eastern Asia, especially as those are traditionally altruistic societies? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it turns out, so first of all, if you've been to Asia, there is a certain altruism in Asia, but I think it's a lot less, um, a, a, a lot less powerful than Western altruism. We have, we have made, um, I mean, Christianity basically is, is so altruistic in a way that Asians don't understand. I mean, a lot of you are wearing crosses. What does a cross represent? What it represents somebody dying for our sins. I mean, the worst kind of death possible. Not for his sins. I can understand that. You want to, you sin, you should die or you should suffer, right? But somebody else dying for my sins? That's like the most unjust thing I've ever heard of. That's real altruism. And that's our symbol. East Asians don't have that. They tend to value family. They tend to value the people around them, but, but there is value to family. And there's value to people around them. Now that sometimes they do that too much. We all do that too much, value our families too much. Uh, so I think they're less altruistic than we think. And I think in, in, there's a sense in which uh, this kind of uh, universal altruism is much more embedded in the West because of Christianity than it is in, in Asia. But look, they have exactly the same economy. They, they are living mostly for themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, living for themselves in a, in a, at a certain level because they don't, they don't, they, they're not consistent. None of us are consistent, right? Unless we've adopted kind of a consistent set of ideas and very few of us have. So when Asians, like any other people in the world, are allowed freedom, where their property rights are protected, where they can make money and keep it, they produce. And they thrive. And in each one of the South Asian countries, the tigers, right? South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and Hong Kong. While none of them are perfectly capitalist and while none of them are perfectly free, they've allowed a significant amount of freedom. They basically protected property rights. They basically protected contract rights and left people free to do it. And they've been unbelievably successful as a consequence. But even Japan, after World War II, Japan basically adopted a constitution that was written by General MacArthur. It was written by an American for them. It's a constitution that in many ways resembled the American constitution. It's not a constitution the Japanese would have ever written for themselves because it doesn't align with their culture. But it's a constitution that kind of defined how that culture has evolved over the last 70 years. And it's evolved in a very freedom-oriented direction, and that led to the huge economic success. So when you adopt the ideas of individual liberty, when you allow people to go out there and live, then you do well. Let's, let's just do China quickly. China's always like this big mystery, right? Didn't the government do it? Didn't the government policy create Chinese wealth? You hear that a lot. And the answer is no. If you look at where the wealth creation in China has happened, it's happened you, always. It's happened in the private sector, in the areas of China where the government has basically been hands off. So the first area where the government went hands off was in, uh, uh, I think it's called Guangzhou province in, um, in, in the south, south east, uh, bordering Hong Kong. Shenzhen is one of the cities that went from population basically of zero to a population of, I don't know, well over 10 million. Dongguan is a city that went from, pop didn't exist, and today it has, you know, eight plus million. Um, and Guangzhou is this massive city that has done phenomenally well. And what happened is Deng Xiaoping went there um, early when he, uh, after he took power, and he looked across, he, he saw Hong Kong, and he, and he saw young Chinese risking their lives to escape to Hong Kong, and he said, his, his, his people wanted to build bigger walls. We always wanted to build walls to keep up people in or to keep other people out. And he said, you know what? Let's try something different. Let's try emulating Hong Kong. And he said, let's take this area, not the rest of China, just this area, very little regulation, no regulation, basically, allow foreign capital to come in and allow people to start businesses and be free and be entrepreneurial and do what they want. And the area went like that.
economic growth went like that. Millions of people started immigrating into the area because there were so many jobs, more jobs than they could, they could fulfill for the people locally. So people came from the countryside. So then he said, okay, well, let's try this in Shanghai. Same thing happened. Let's try it in somewhere else. Same thing happened. All the places where this was tried saw explosive economic growth. Other parts of China where this wasn't tried stayed poor. So it was, now, a lot of that is being reversed right now by Xi, by, by uh, uh, the current leader of, of, of China. And you'll see economic growth decline. China really risks going into negative economic growth as a consequence. Where you have freedom, you get growth. You have economic success. Where you don't have freedom, you don't have economic success, even in China.